Gull Power, we ask why this dangerous menace is not being shot on sight. Staying with bucket and spade destinations, if you're booking your summer break, why not throw in an evening sport? Tim Pillbeam is in Spain for Boar and Mouflon. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Summer just around the corner, seaside towns will be hoping to bring the tourists flocking. But these days, sunstroke and a kiss me quick hat are the least of your worries. It's the locals you need to worry about. They terrorise anyone in the search for food, and they are nasty and bold as David and I witnessed on lunchtime in the middle of Eastbourne. It's as if they know they are untouchable. Yes, seagulls are protected, even though there are calls for a cull. Unfortunately, it doesn't leave many options to move them on. And this is what the seagull took, so you can imagine, if that catches your thumb, it's going to hurt. We asked residents in one coastal town, my hometown of Eastbourne, what they thought should happen to the birds. If you're holding food in your hand, they'll attack it. They're fine in their rightful place on the hills and on the cliffs, but not in the town. I don't mind them at all. I think people are provoked them by feeding them all the time. So for me, they're just part of the natural environment of the seafront. They these two seem to be flying rodents. They don't seem to be under control by any means. With mixed reviews from the public, we asked an increasingly busy pest controller what solutions there are to get rid of the birds. I think people have become more aware that they can become aggressive and they will swoop for food and things like that and take a chance. You know, that is a problem to, to people obviously. But there are many things that can be done. You know, I wouldn't go down that route of culling. I would say that a better idea would be uh, to remove the gulls eggs and put dummy eggs in. Seagulls are sit quite patiently on them, hoping that they're going to um, hatch out, but of course they never do. That's one sort of method. Speak to anyone in this town about seagulls and there are some real tales to tell. But the problems aren't just here by the coast, they're much further inland and there are some real horror stories. Students at Sussex University in Brighton have been on the receiving end of some serious attacks. One girl had her lip bitten off as she went to bite her sandwich at the same time a gull came in for his lunch. It's got so serious, the university has had to bring in the pros. It's a well-known fact that seagulls are becoming, uh, uh, increasingly becoming urban pests and moving more and more inland and away from the coastline. They have been known to dive bomb students whilst they're uh, sitting here having their lunch. There's a factor also of, of building defects because um, once a seagull lands and nests on a flat roof um, and they start multiplying, this can cause problems going forward for the building, i.e. block drains from their feathers and all the debris that they leave behind. This is George and his handler Gary. They are here to deter the goals, allowing the students to concentrate on their studies and not look out for the next aerial assault. Well, it's mainly his presence here. I don't know if you can hear in the background, you can hear goals calling out with their alarm call. They're not very happy because George is here. And uh, they, they start that alarm call actually when I turn up here because they've even recognised the vehicle. They've made that association. Uh, they know what comes out of the vehicle, so that, that's why they're calling up. So they just feel a little bit nervous about being here and they, they just drift away. So it's his presence here that really does that. He doesn't fly directly at the gulls. Uh, he just flies around and my job here really is to make George visible to the gulls here which is quite an easy job so I either walk him round or he flies around here and periodically I call him back to the fist for a small reward of food. The other thing I, I do here I, I, uh, I go on all the rooftops here and I bring down any nesting material and I am under a general license uh, allowed to take the, the, the gulls eggs but you can't harm the live bird that's what you mustn't do. So I bring down all the nesting material. Um, that was a big problem last year. There was probably 
maybe, I don't know, 60 to 70 gulls trying to nest here. So it's just a question of breaking the habit. So they now breed somewhere else. So it's somewhere else's problem and not the university's problem. We did ask East One Council for comment on the issue, but their PR office said, this isn't something we consider East One has a problem with and don't wish to enter into a national debate. And it is a national debate. The issue has even been debated in Parliament and commented on by the Prime Minister. But that isn't stopping them doing actual bodily harm. Considering what we saw in just five minutes armed with only a Happy Meal, it's probably about time these large, strong, determined birds are taken seriously. Because next time, it may be more than half a burger bun. Alex and David attracting the wrong sort of birds in Eastbourne there. And please tell us what the seagull situation is in your area. Right, he says he's had an argument with a fence post. We say more Botox fail. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Lincolnshire Police Force has released this video of them crushing a car which used to belong to headquarters to show their intent. The car was seized as part of Operation Galileo, the force's effort to deter illegal headquarters. We've seized 20 plus dogs this season. They really don't like their dog season. The BBC faces a five year ban of all tiger reserves in India. The National Tiger Conservation Authority announced the ban after the BBC South Asia correspondent Justin Rowlatt made a documentary called One World Killing for Conservation, which highlighted the shoot to kill policy on rhino poachers at Kaziranga National Park. Snake hunters are heading for Florida. There are 150,000 Burmese pythons loose in one and a half million acres of Everglades and they're destroying local wildlife. So far the state has tried dedicated sniffer dogs, snake hunters from India's mountain dwelling Irulu tribe and now it's advertising for minimum wage civilian python catchers on a two month contract for a hunt beginning in April. Grizzly bears and other predators are to rejoin the quarry list in Alaska. The US Congress has voted to overturn an Obama-era rule prohibiting the hunting of bears, wolves and other predators in Alaska's wildlife refuges. The state of Alaska argues that the hunting of predators to control their populations is necessary to preserve caribou, moose and deer. A man who jumped into crocodile-infested waters to impress a girl gets bitten and then turned down. What were you thinking that first moment when the crocodile latched on? I was thinking I'm gone. Lee DePore, aged 18, bragged to an English backpacker that he could swim Australia's Johnston River in the dark. He jumped into the river and was set upon by a crocodile who mauled him. He said he had drunk about 10 cups of goon, but managed to escape the crocodile by gouging its eyes and made it back to shore with one floppy arm. And finally, a boomerang may be good against a roo, but not so good against a drone. In this YouTube video by Drone Gear, the DJI Phantom 4 Pro manages to take the whack of the weapon, which breaks. The drone is disturbed from its original position by the whack, but finds its wings again very quickly. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now, we're always encouraging people to seek out adventure when the opportunity arises. When you are booking your family break this year, why not have a look at the local sporting opportunities at the same time? Tim Pillbeam did. After Tim's success in the mountains above Benidorm for Barbary sheep, he's been offered the chance to spend the evening not as tradition demands, enjoying a busy bar and watching the world go by, but alone in a high seat looking for pigs and mutton. The terrain an hour north of the coast is very different to the sparsely covered mountain slopes, and it offers plenty of opportunities for hunting. What animals have we got in this, in this part of the country? In this part of the country, always wild boars because the wild boar in Spain, they are everywhere. But also there are some mouflons and of course Barbary sheep because it is, a, it is the, the area in the east of Spain, Barbary sheep, it is the king. From here to the 
50 kilometers there is a flat, and there is a cult there is a agriculture, then they come every night. As with any of these international hunting trips, it's always a surprise to see what is accepted when the lights go out, either stalking or on a high seat. What are the rules? You, but you can actually spot. You can spot, but you can spot, but you cannot shoot. Yeah. Then you cannot you cannot have a, one scope with night vision, uh, with uh, thermal vision. It is forbidden by law. But you can spot with a. Uh, it is forbidden the thermal, but not the night vision. Okay. Then you can use just to to take a look at the but listen, there are some wild boars coming. Then you take your rifle, you take your light, and you shoot. Okay. A few high seats along from us will be a bow hunter. This is the first time someone has been allowed to bow hunt in this area. 55 uh, pounds. 55 pounds pull. Yeah. No, no, it's very heavy and it's good for hunting uh, 25 meters uh, to 40 meters. So it's good to shoot in the night and in the, in the day, no problem. In Spain, it's permit to use binoculars to see the animals in the night. So you spot I, them I, coming? Yes, when I come in, I can uh, I can see if it's a, a female or it's a male, and I can choose the animal I want to hunt. Bow hunting has grown very fast in Spain, helped by a handful of Spanish hunters sponsored by the big US bow brands. The high seat overlooks a waterhole. The animals could come from any direction, so Tim gets acquainted with the area and the night vision kit he's been loaned. Whenever I'm in a high seat, the first thing I do once I set myself down is look at my field of view and I'll just use my rangefinder just to, so I mentally know exactly where everything is. There's a tree down in the middle of the field there, it's 150 metres away. Um, always, everything here is very close by, down through there, 130 metres. So I know literally exactly what range everything is. So if an animal does suddenly quickly turn, cut a pair here, I can actually just know exactly what the range is. So it's very useful to have a, a range finder either in your binoculars or have a separate one and just ping everything. Then you make a mental note and that's your shooting area. And we came out here purely to hunt Barbary sheep and uh, we've got the option now uh, of shooting mouflon and wild boar. How brilliant is that? It's tough to stay quiet in a tin high seat perched on metal chairs, but we do it, and a group of mouflon appear from the right. The high seat's probably about 50, 70 metres away, not very far at all. We're using a 308 calibre tonight, um, 150 grain ballistic tip, so um, quite a punchy round for a, such a small beast. Um, took it through the shoulder here, so it went down very, very quickly. Tim considers returning to the seat, but then decides to clean the mouflon. He also has some advice for any would-be high seat shooters to ensure you don't destroy your hearing. My preference as a stalker is actually always on foot. Um, I just prefer it as opposed to high seats. But this high seat is made of tin and when I moved around very, very carefully I just had the muzzle just past the window. But gosh, when that uh, 308 let rip, the whole tin just went and David's and I's our ears just rang for about three minutes afterwards. So uh, quite a hefty calibre, 
um, but uh, that's what happens in, the, in these high seats sometimes. The most important thing is to make sure your muzzle is outside of the high seat, otherwise it's very, very painful. Of course, the other advice is to wear ear protection. Very, very good condition, actually, considering how uh, dry it is in Spain at the moment. They've got, got huge problems with, with the drought. It's now averaging about 40 degrees for about three weeks, which is quite unusual. And um, the Barbary sheep can survive because they, they, they eat the leaves to get the moisture. Whereas things like the mouflon and the boar, they desperately need the moisture. That's why they come into the waterhole. So uh, it's not a good time for, for livestock or livestock in, in, uh, in Spain. So this, uh, this little, little young lad will make absolutely beautiful eating. So uh, I'll go back in the food chain and uh, it's just lovely to see such a clean looking specimen. It's been a long day in Spain, but after a day charging around like a mountain goat, it's quite nice to sit and wait for the wildlife to come to us. For more information about hunting in Spain with Fernando, go to SpanishHunters.com. Thank you, Tim, who will be returning with more rucksack and rifle adventures later in the year. Next up, let's go from Spain to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube. It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Robin Foxer has brought out his best days pigeon shooting with, he says, some shots he reckons would make George Digweed proud. 128 pigeons plus a crow and jackdaw. Andy and John from Hunting COC shoot a dog fox in the Welsh hills and then talk about it afterwards. It's all about keeping the farmer happy during lambing. Video Shaspesh.com is out for an exceptional boar drive or batu in the maze. 25 empty cases on the ground afterwards. It's Central Mars on a private farm in North Island, New Zealand just before the raw starts. Clark Boys Hunting NZ has a weekend shooting, a couple of nice deer to take home. Moving to South Island, Wild Game NZ is wallaby hunting. They are on Department of Conservation or DOC land, so there are not a lot of marsupials but enough to give them some challenging shots. Over the sea to Australia and Gretchy is duck hunting in Victoria. This is the 2017 duck open experience potted down to a few minutes. I have been shooting in Labrador and this film brings it all back. Moose and ptarmigan hunting is, as its maker William Larkham Jr. says, a large day in the big land. And finally, a first-person retrieve, inspired by the film where we attached a camera to a golden eagle and sent it off to live hares. Reich van der Vaarte puts one on his Labrador and sends it off to dead geese. That's it for this week. I have put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the link or go to bit.ly slash hunting YouTube 383. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or subscribe to us on YouTube. Or best of all, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain, by email. It comes out 7pm every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye.